this topic couldn't possibly be more timely uh, than it is right at this moment. And, and uh, so Chip, even though I don't have your resume in front of me, I'll just start by saying that that Chip is like like my own personal internationally known expert on extremist groups. And he he lived in Burlington for many for decades, and and I would I would invite him uh, to come to the temple every three years to talk to the confirmation class about cults when we were doing comparative religions, and and um, I've also called him numerous times to help decipher weird swastika like symbols that, that appear in in the area, um, and and so he's just like it's it's amazing that that we've got. Uh, we had him in town, and he, he's moved all the way to Salem uh, <laughs> to be with the witches. Yeah, to be with the witches, but but um, it, it's it's really an honor and, and a pleasure to have him here, and 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 he's just so knowledgeable about this, and and uh, people are around the country, like the news outlets, often often uh, call on him to interpret what's going on. And, and it used to be that, that, that these little extremist fringe groups, we, we would, you know, we would discuss them. And I would always say, like, think like, oh, there are so few of them, you know, like, like, like nothing ever of consequence would, would ever happen with any of these groups. They're, they're, they're just, you know, but, but apparently uh, I was totally proven wrong as I think many of us were and, and now, they're front and center. So, uh, so I really, really appreciate our ability to to have Chip here to to, to maybe to, to talk about um, who they are, what's going on, and what the future of these groups might be in light of of what's uh, what's just been happening in our country. So, Chip, take it away. Thank you very much. It's uh, I I miss being in Burlington uh, and uh, speaking to the confirmation class. Um, it's it's hard to basically sound not sound kind of snotty about this, but yeah, I back in the year two thousand. Um, a friend of mine and I, uh, Matthew Ann Lyons, and I wrote a book called Right Wing Populism in America, uh, Too Close for Comfort. And the tagline was Too Close for Comfort. Like, you know, it, a right wing populist national movement could uh, appear at any time and uh, might be powerful. Now, to be honest, we could not have predicted a, a Donald Trump. That's just, um, he was too bizarrely unique. Uh, but the idea of a right-wing populist movement emerging uh, definitely was on our minds. And that's what we saw emerging uh, quite a few years before Trump. And you saw it with the kind of exemplary violence, as it's called in sociology, of the bombing of the uh, federal building in Oklahoma City. And so basically, that's, these are groups that have been around since before the nation was founded. Uh, obviously, the most clear example of that was the late 1800s and the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, but there are other movements much smaller than that uh, until recently. And, and then the Trump movements, the movements that started to rise uh, in around right-wing republicanism uh, after Goldwater, because Goldwater was actually a libertarian. And uh, what we see is these groups moving away from libertarianism of the Goldwater Republicans and moving towards a more uh, racist and anti-Semitic and xenophobic anti-immigrant uh, kind of ethos that we've seen throughout U.S. history. Uh, so it wasn't anything new. What was really surprising was how fast it interlaced itself with rising anxiety about the future of the United States, both politically and in terms of gender relations and in terms of uh, the dwindling number of uh, white Protestant evangelicals, which just for fun I happen to be. I went in a very different direction, what can I say? But uh, 
I think it's important to understand that uh, Trump came out of a military academy environment with a father who is a multi millionaire and picked up the worst of both aspects of private wealth and the training of an authoritarian high school uh, where, uh, oddly enough, my uh, brother was the catcher to Donald Trump's pitcher. Uh, my brother played the piccolo in the marching band. Uh, just one of those things. So that the militarism of Trump was forged in his high school experience, but also was a kind of the sneering macho xenophobia and uh, anti-Semitism, which I think I recognized as a young man because I did not want to go to the New York Military Academy as being an undercurrent at the very least at New York Military Academy, which overwhelmingly uh, promoted a uh, straight white Christian uh, ethos. And and my brother stayed in touch with Donald Trump, would occasionally have, you know, wave at him at uh, restaurants in New York City, but never was a fan of him. And it was kind of appalling when uh, one day at Thanksgiving, he was talking about Trump uh, as someone he had been in high school with. And he said, well, the problem with Donald Trump is that uh, He's, he's a bully and a jerk, which uh, didn't bode well for the presidency. And as, as we now see, he remained a bully and a jerk. So I think to explain it, we have to look at the social and political movements that back Trump, which preexisted Trump. And they go way back. They go back to the early settlers who came from a very doctrinaire and um, authoritarian form of Protestantism. Uh, now, I hasten to add, I'm, a, I'm a, uh, still involved in a Protestant uh, church activities. I attend uh, church, I take communion, uh, but I, I take a very different idea of what that means. And so it's important to understand there are many different ways of practicing uh, uh, basically Christianity. For instance, I'm an, uh, someone who has worked closely with Ruby Sales, who is a uh, famous uh, civil rights activist who was actually um, went to the uh, went to the school at uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and and studied the um, at the Presbyterian the Protestant the Protestant, what would you call it? it? It was not a training school, but it was basically was a religious study area of uh, Tufts University. And so to see what was the value of a kind of l l progressive multiracial uh, form of, of this belief system uh, religiously, and then to see the relig religious belief system of Trump and his form of really vicious, uh, white, racist, anti-Semitic, anti-Islamic, homophobic uh, Protestantism was just terrifying for so many of us who uh, still practice those religious beliefs. Now, Trump, was predictable. Uh, he had his beliefs. He uh, was basically, oops, must turn that off. Uh, he was basically a bigot, a bully. Uh, he was an anti-Semite despite his philo-Semitic attitudes around some Jews and, and is some aspects of the state of Israel. Um, but I think there were certainly people at the Anti-Defamation League, the American Jewish Committee, the American Jewish Congress who pointed out that, you know, there, there are different kinds of philo-Semitism and, and support for Israel. And, and many of these organizations uh, constantly were pointing out issues involving Donald Trump and, and uh, both anti-Semitism and anti-Israeli kind of tropes at, at the very least. Now, have these groups gone away? No, they haven't. Uh, 
uh, we're looking at a form of right-wing populism that really can be traced back to the founding settlers who were uh, at least ostensibly straight white Christian men who practiced a very doctrinaire form of Protestantism, uh, which today is found largely in pockets in the South and certain other areas, uh, and in which uh, the xenophobia and, and racism and anti-Semitism is very profound. So this is well studied in, in all forms of social science. Uh, and yet the mainstream media failed miserably at doing its job. It wasn't like there wasn't the Anti-Defamation League, the American Jewish Committee, the American Jewish Congress, political research associates, uh, the uh, center at Berkeley, uh, for the study of, of, of essentially the radical right uh, groups at Yale University. It, it, it was appalling given the mountain of resources, not to mention the new edition of the Encyclopedia uh, Judaica, which I contributed to, uh, that the mainstream media failed miserably at really holding the Trump administration and Trump himself and a number of other people in the administration accountable. Now, you know, I, I what I'd like to do is have uh, Rabbi Evanson uh, solicit a handful of questions because I could talk about this for hours, but I wouldn't know uh, and have as too many people know, but I, I wouldn't be answering your question. So I'd like to see if she could field a couple of questions and then I will actually make note of them, literally type them down and see if I can then frame the rest uh, of the next portion at the very least uh, based on your interests. Andy, do we have any? Yeah, so um, I mean, I'll encourage people to send me or or Susan you know, the the, any any thoughts you have on the questions? We did have one question come in already while you were talking. Um, it, it, one of the, one of our members has been reading Malala's book um, again, and uh, she postulates in that book, if you're familiar with it, I'm sure you are, you know, that that the reasons that extremists got such a foothold in Pakistan was due to lack of education. Um, do you think that that's an issue here in the U.S. or in parts of the U.S. as you you, you sort of referred to, um, you know, or at least a lack of critical thinking? Well, it, in many ways, it's definitely a lack of critical thinking. It's also a lack of understanding what the nature of pluralism is, the very idea uh, of which our nation was founded, which is that it would be pluralistic. There'd be all different kinds of people. Now, of course, it was originally founded. It was all, you know, run by straight white Christian men who were essentially, you know, uh, doctrinaire Protestants who couldn't get along with anybody else in the mother country. Uh, now, there are still those churches uh, in the United States, but overwhelmingly Protestantism uh, and even most forms of Presbyterianism uh, walked away from that kind of nasty anti-Semitic Calvinism. Uh, having said that, there are still people throughout the country who go to Christian churches every Sunday and hear references from the Old Testament and then are linked to references in the New Testament, which I think are anti-Semitic. And I say that as a, a practicing Christian who takes communion. I mean, you, you can't look at the Bible as a static book that doesn't require some kind of reevaluation periodically, because it does. Uh, there are all sorts of religious books that are founding documents that are reviewed and reappraised constantly by the clergy and the believers in those, in those traditions. And so the, we're partly the victim of a failure of American pluralistic so-called secular journalism in which few two journalists really understand the nature of religious belief. Uh, many of them, you know, at bars that I used to go to in New York when I was visiting, uh, treated people of religious religious faith, no matter what the faith, as essentially stupid uh, and full of 
myth. Uh, and of course, you know, the, all countries have founding myths. It's, it's all religions have founding myths. And it's what the people who practice those aspects of organization at the time do with those myths. And some myths are constantly being reconstructed to meet the needs of a, a society that's moving forward in terms of inclusivity and, and diversity. Uh, we still are looking at a mainstream media uh, that is claiming to look more at diversity, uh, but still overlooking uh, religions like Judaism, religions like Islam, um, and engaging in stereotypes, especially in popular uh, television entertainment programs. And it's interesting you mentioned the media, because I feel like the media right now is as divisive in many ways as the politicians and, and, and you know, any, any thoughts on you, the Fox versus CNN and fake news versus, you know, <laughs> right wing news. Well, if I have to watch a station, I'll watch CNN, not Fox News, but I also watch Fox News to see what the rhetoric is and, and what the buzz issues are at any given moment. Um, all media are biased. Anybody who says that their journalism is not biased is either a liar or a fool. Uh, there's this great journalist uh, uh, critic, uh, George Seldes, who uh, I actually used to go and have lunch with up in Heartland Four Corners, uh, Vermont, when he was like 98 years old. We all thought he was dead in the alternative press when we saw him in one of those little frames on the movie Reds, where living purple people talked about uh, the period in Europe uh, around the time of Mussolini and and others and and Hitler. So it's. No surprise that every new generation of journalists has to relive the lesson of figuring out what biases their upbringing and education has brought into the media and then stepping out of those and challenging the entrenched biases that we find in all mainstream and alternative media. There's no such thing as an unbiased media. And so we need to be what a lot of media critics call educated consumers of mass media. We need to know when we're getting something that's relatively factual. We need to know when that's shifting into opinion and uh, just junk news. And we need to complain more. <laughs> There's another question here. I, um, I'll take the next one. And, uh, somebody asked, in your opinion, what is the best path forward for the situation in our country? Talk to our neighbors. Talk to our neighbors, no matter who they are. Talk to people we work with. Strike up conversations saying, wow, we got ourselves into a mess, didn't we? Uh, how do we get out of this mess? And uh, and then, you know, I always talk when I'm, when I'm training. I'm not a sociologist, but I play one on TV. I want to get my head away. Well, then there's that stupid. I'm going to live with the, the uh, light switch for me. For me. Uh, basically, everyone is biased. Uh, you need to learn how to talk to people on their own terms if you're going to get them to change their biases. And that requires a little bit of an ability to step back and ask them questions that lead them in a direction where they begin to see themselves as perhaps biased. Um, it's not, you know, it doesn't help to say to a neighbor, well, that's just anti-Semitic or that's just anti-Catholic or that's racist or homophobic or, or whatever, because they just tune that out immediately. Um, it helps to learn to have start, you know, and I, again, when I'm teaching young sociologists, I have no degrees, but I teach sociologists now. Uh, I say, you got to learn how to walk up to somebody at a bus stop and start a conversation. And if you can't do that, you'll never be a sociologist and you'll probably never be a very good journalist. So um, my, my current screen is slowly falling backwards off the front of uh, back of my table. So I'll try and keep up with it. Uh, don't know why that's happening, but hey, it's 
it's an ongoing problem. It's not going to go away. Bias exists in all forms of journalism, even the ones you like. And we are now coming out of a period when, with Trump, the combination of a large right-wing populist movement, a large right-wing Christian movement, and um, a person who was a phallocentric, egomaniacal putz was running the country. Now, is that likely to happen again? I pray not. But, you know, it, it, these people come and go, and we, we have to teach our children how to deal with them. And that's one of the things I know that uh, when I was teaching the young classes at the temple, we talked about there, you're going to go to college soon, and you're going to run into people. Back when I started, there were people feeling for the bump on the heads of the Jews who came out of the farm belt, because that's what they had been told in church, um, the mark of the beast or the mark of Satan. So it's there have been great strides. So yay, America. Uh, but it's not done yet. And we now see with Trump how easily that was turned around into a mass movement that was... Um, claiming support for Israel and claiming to be a friend of the Jews, but clearly not being a friend to all people in the United States and not really being a friend to Jews. First of all, you're kind of like 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 migrating off the screen. <laughs> yes, I am. I can fix that now. It's because the silly, the silly thing is moving and I can fix that. Sorry, it was kind of... I'm trying not to have the... I have to put the, like a card over that light switch. It it appalls me. So this is this is me in my actual, you know, messy uh, office with lights and slide sorters and switches. That's, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna just jump in and ask a question. What what about like groups like the Proud Boys and and the other the the, the other group we're hearing about? Like 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 what's what what's happening with them now that that they're being outed in such a negative. Well, they were always pretty, they were viewed by the mainstream media and a lot of the researchers who study writing movements as very negative. So I don't think that is going to change very much in terms of their internal dynamics. And they will still, with many other right wing and what I call right wing, phallocentric, anti Semitic, anti Islamic, you know, bigots, that these groups are still there and they're still networking on uh, all kinds of media, media that you probably have never been on. Um, and so there's a big job ahead for groups like the Anti-Defamation League, the American Jewish Committee, the American Jewish Congress, uh, my favorite nonprofit group, the uh, Political Research Associates, which I worked at for many, many years. It's it's not going to go away. We need to stay on our alert. And um, you're going to see more outbreaks of violence. So, what, what, like, what do you have any sense of, like, what what they're saying now amongst themselves? Like, 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 what their next move is? Like, 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 are they planning their next attack or, or somewhere, know? somewhere on the fringes of the uh, militant right wing in America, someone is planning an attack. Uh, you can count on it. Uh, there was a meeting before the Oklahoma City bombing in um, up in the Pacific Northwest, which included the Anti-Defamation League, the American Jewish Congress, the American Jewish Committee, uh, all sorts of people. Uh, a friend of mine who now teaches college, um, who was then working for the American Jewish Committee, wrote a long memo to the FBI saying, based on our research as a group that met, uh, we expect there to be violence against a federal building or federal facility in the next six months. This was just a few months before the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, the government brushed us off because we weren't experts. Well, we were experts. We just weren't their experts. Um, 
you know, when I had a friend who ended up high up in the Justice Department, I mean, she could walk 10 steps and be in the office of the Attorney General of the United States during the siege at Waco at the Branch Davidian compound. And there was a group of us who were with the Center for Millennial Studies, and this was a millennial group in, in Waco, and we were trying to get through to the FBI saying, stop shouting at them, stop playing loud rock music, stop shining searchlights in their windows. These are apocalyptic Christians. They will react violently either outwardly or inwardly. And they did. So there are people now who I say are half my age and twice as smart about this stuff who are still being ignored by federal agencies uh, because they don't have the credentials that are res respected in those federal agencies. So I, I don't know what to say other than uh, it hurts to say it. Things haven't changed that much. You go to the Department of Homeland Security website, there still is really old fashioned social science on that website. Uh, and I recently got into an argument with a person, I swear this is true, and uh, I wrote about it at, uh, at a public website. Um, there's still anti-Semitic conspiracy theories posted on the Department of Homeland Security website. Uh, you know, I can I can send the rabbi a, a link. Uh, you know, I don't want to broadcast it because then somebody might attack it. You never know. Uh, but basically, if you go to the Department of Homeland Security, you will find uh, a number of links by a particular uh, individual who has a, a degree uh, talking about essentially the same stuff you find in the protocols of the uh, learned elders of Zion. Uh, it's horrifying. Thank you. Andy, you want to ask the other question? Yeah, so we had one question. You know, you talked about some of these these extremist groups. Are you aware of any of them being active in our area of you know, Burlington and Bedford? And, 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 I mean, how, 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 how much of it is a, is it a local thing? Well, local where? I mean, I think you'll find that there are people in living room meetings uh, very similar to these groups in every state uh, in the United States, live in their living rooms having meetings. Sometimes these meetings move out to taverns, never a good place for a meeting full of anti-Semites. Um, so, yeah, it's still a problem. It's still festering. It will always be there. And I think under Biden, you know, once he starts to clear out the kind of terrible social science, quote unquote, that was posted up on the uh, DHS website and with help from, you know, the American Jewish Congress, American Jewish Committee and ADL, I think that will be uh, accelerated uh, because I think these are groups that were ignored for far too long. And it's not like I don't have disagreements with them, but they do good work. And the government should have been listening to them. And under Trump, the government sort of passed over them more often than not, which was a very bad uh, thing to have happened. So I think things will get better. Uh, but I think we need to be constantly vigilant. I think um, no matter who you are in the United States, you need to be careful uh, for people who decide that there's some other, whoever that other is, that uh, are creating the problem in the situation is to deal with them in some way uh, from shutting them to violence. And those groups will always form and come up like, you know, uh, I don't know, moss in your basement. <laughs> what, well, you had one question here. Why does it seem like so many of these right wing radicals come from a military background? And you you alluded to military school and and, uh, and, and being an influence on Trump, for example. Well, it's interesting if you ask if you reverse the sociology, you say uh, how many people who went through military training and served end up in these groups, the number is actually quite small. If you say are a dismally, if, I, do a disproportionate number of the visible members of these groups 
groups come out of some military background? The answer is yes. And then you start getting into these quantitative studies where they also say, what well, they also come out of upper middle class neighborhoods that were never in the military. So it's really, really much more complicated than that. And one of the things that sociologists do, and I have to plug in my American Sociological Association card here, I am not a sociologist, but I play one on TV. But I am a uh, member of the American Sociological Association as a non-academic member. And there's tremendous information you can not only find in publications by people in that organization, but also you can just go on Wikipedia and see some really good stuff by people who have degrees, or you can go to uh, a variety of other websites that host academic and scholarly publications and type in anti-Semitism or anti-Jewish phobia or any number of key words and you'll see literally hundreds of publicly available downloadable studies by people who have advanced degrees or, or have written knowledgeably on these subjects. But yeah, you said more of the visible members of these groups. So you, is there a reason the military element you know, is more out, outwardly focused? I mean, do they uh, go back to their military training and say this is a great outlet for it or something like that? It's a, it's, it's a tough one to answer because you, you would have to have the data from the other direction to answer that question reliably. In other words, we don't know how many people who serve in the military end up in these groups. We know how many people in these groups previously served in the military, but that's not the way you do social science. So the answer is, it does appear that a lot of the people in these movements that became aggressive and violent went through some military training, but it's not fair to suggest that military training is a prerequisite for joining these groups. Thank you. It's, it's Andy. It seems like some people are sending me questions, and some people. Are <laughs> That's questions. okay. Go for it. <laughs> All right, um, so I have another question here. How do you change beliefs that are founded in false information? Because many Trump followers act like they're cult members. Very similar. Uh, what's a cult but uh, a, an aggravated form of what you just said? Uh, people live in what's called an information bubble. And I actually have a friend who studies cults, uh, and he writes about them as essentially people living in an information bubble. And uh, one of the ways people are pulled into cults is that they've taken away from parental structures. They're taken away from their peer group, they're taken uh, away from their school environments, and they're fed a steady data of misinformation. And after a while, misinformation fed to you by people you respect becomes reliable information. It's just that simple. I wish it wasn't. I mean, one of the problems, if you look at all of the totalitarian movements on the left and right in the last 100 years, is that propaganda works, whether it's on the left or the right, propaganda works. Uh, as I said, I used to go and have uh, lunch with George Seldes, and uh, he was the king of explaining how propaganda works. And he, he and um, I.F. Stone, who I also knew and, and used to have lunch with, uh, used to talk about impropaganda uh, along with uh, another student of the propaganda. Uh, uh, so it's like, since the turn of the late 1800s, we've understood how this works. Since the growth of a true mass media, uh, we know how this works. And in fact, one of the things I do when I lecture, and I gave a lecture at um, at, at a, a Jewish institution in New York uh, that was recorded, uh, where I said, look, you know, it, you look at the misinformation that was put out by Telegraph against the Armenians during the genocide. And it is replicated by Hitler in his genocide of Jews. So that the Telegraph predated the radio in terms of forging a genocide. Radio forged the genocide of Jews. Uh, you know, you look at uh, the War of the Worlds, and it should have been 
something that the government paid attention to, but more importantly, something that mass media people paid more attention to. Because we saw with Trump that a mass media channel became a um, their stirmer on television. Uh, and I know that's a pretty vicious thing to say, but I think that's what Fox News became. It became the online television uh, stand-in for Der Sturmer. And uh, if you don't know what Der Sturmer is, you can go to the Holocaust Memorial Museums and, and centers and, and look up copies of Hitler's favorite newspaper, The Stormer. Uh, the Stormer was the name of a anti-Semitic, anti-Black uh, publication by a, a white supremacist that was published in the 1970s out of the South. Uh, this stuff is going to come back again. It just goes, it goes away until the focus is off on it and it comes back. That's why we need groups like the ADL, the American Jewish Committee, and the American Jewish Congress, and and my favorite new group up at uh, the university, uh, run by um, uh, Ken Stern. Uh, so, thank you, Andy. Do you have more questions? I actually have one for myself. I'm not going to read somebody else's question. It's my question. Sure, <laughs> but, uh, uh, go for it. And go for it, exactly, Chip. Thanks. Uh, so you kind of foresaw a lot of this in your first book, and you said, you know, you. You predicted some of this and, and saw saw these these groups emerging, um, and you know the, the Oklahoma City Federal Building bombing, for example. But it was one person acting. Were you surprised at the size of the insurrection and as uh, you know how many people were you know in, involved in that? I two years ago, I and if that had happened two years ago, I would have said I was surprised. Uh, there, you should know that uh, about twenty of us, including people from ADL and the Congress and the committee and all sorts of other groups, have been talking about the inevitability of what happened for over a year and trying to stop it and trying to urge people in Congress to hold hearings and trying to warn. But, you know, Trump made it very difficult for there to be a, a sensible conversation about this. I mean, it's hardly a secret. I'm in touch with other researchers who supply information to all three of the major Jewish institutions because we're scared. You know, there's about 15 of us around the country. Some of them are journalists. Some of them are professors. Some of them are just cranks like me. And and we have a kind of a dialogue. Let's not say we don't. We make sure that other people learn about this one way or another because there's not enough research on this. And I have to say, I don't trust the government to do research on this because look at what happened under Trump. All of the government institutions that should have been talking about the rise of anti-Semitism and racism and homophobia and Islamophobia under Trump pretty much stepped back. And, and you had... ADL and the American Jewish Committee and the American Jewish Congress and, you know, the Simon Wiesenthal Center saying, no, seriously, seriously, look, look at what we're saying. Um, and, and I have, uh, I was, I'm on a group called the Defending Dissent Foundation that generally defends dissent for everyone, including the Klan. Uh, and they began to say, this is getting really scary. The government seems to not pay attention to the violence, which is not free speech. You know, when there is intimidation and threat and violence, that is not free speech. Where is the government on this? And the Trump administration basically told them to buzz off. Uh, so who, who were the groups that, the, uh, the, that were involved in the insurrection? Um, who were the ones actually storming in there? Well, there's a, obviously Q, which is an amorphous group of media consumers. Uh, and the Q is... Uh, 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 a mouthpiece for an uh, unknown individual, a group of individuals who churn out conspiracy theories riddled with anti-Semitism and racism and have for many years and started to gain a following um, in a kind of one step distant away on Fox News and some other channels that people visit and on the web uh, as well, their whole channels and uh, publicly available information where this began to blossom. Um, there's no way to really challenge that through government 
censorship. Uh, however, there needs to be more awareness and pushback against these groups in the journalistic community because they're the only ones in a free speech nation that can raise these issues and they failed. Uh, I mean, a handful of groups didn't and good for them. Uh, but overwhelmingly, the, the, the major television networks failed. Um, the major newspapers failed with few exceptions. Uh, there were some columnists who stayed on this all along. Um, and it didn't work. We didn't gain enough footage. We didn't gain enough mileage. We didn't get enough media play. And I hope now people complain that people who warn about these movements when they're in formation and growing get a little more attention. It, it's not scam honoring to say throughout US history, these, these groups have emerged. And to not be aware that since the first settlers anti-Jewish histrionics have been a part of the American ethos. That's not an exaggeration. So, so, so is Q the biggest group? I think so. I think um, Q in interaction with Fox News became the worst aspect of this. But then there were lots of chat rooms and lots of um, other ways this information got out. But to see it really gaining national attention on mainstream media, if you call Fox News, it's like saying orange so good is wine. It's basically crazy. So, so what's what's the future? I guess most of you don't drink orange so good. You, you <laughs> sort of, it's a 75 cent bottle of wine. Okay. With orange, with orange flavoring. <laughs> so, so what's the future of Q at this point? Oh, he's, his future is diminished, but uh, he'll come back up like a bad erection. <laughs> so, so is Q, I, I never, I never understood, is Q like a person? Uh, is he, was the persona of Q built by a single person? Yes. Did it become a kind of mass fed information outlet, yes. Uh, but essentially, you know, Q, Q was invented by and handled by an individual. And there's actually a lot of really good research now about who that was and how he got pulled into being a, basically a reliable source on a Fox News, which is, you know, again, like saying it's a 50 cent bottle of good wine. I mean, there is no such thing as a reliable news on Fox News. What do you think it says that, you know, it's no longer a fringe or minority group when a senator supporting Q can be elected? <laughs> I mean, it's it. You know, what does that have to tell us? When um, these movements of hostility and conspiracy theory gain a mass following, that is completely predictable and was predicted. Uh, so I guess my answer is, yeah, a lot of us predicted this would happen, and it did. And then I think too many mainstream media outlets didn't say, you know, time out. This is this is scary. We need to talk about these moments, yeah, from a more historic point of view. You know, there there were a number of academics and. Uh, religious leaders and journalists who did talk about it, but the mainstream media uh, decision makers felt it uh, didn't sell under arm deodorant well enough. Are, are there other questions? Anybody else have other questions? Someone wants to put Chip on the spot here. Uh, you, you may choose not to answer this one. I will uh, answer honestly anything <laughs> because that's what I think good journalists and, and good what, scholars do. <laughs> what do you think is going to happen with the impeachment trial? Oh, I have no idea. That's my, <laughs> hon that's my honest answer. I mean, I think what we're seeing is excellent. Uh, I think uh, the people asking the questions are among the best among us. And I actually um, have met one of them and thought and and his cohort and his family and he's doing a great job so it's 
you know, and and, and that's Raskin, uh, who's you know, f father was a leading intellectual at the uh, Institute for Policy Studies, and and was someone who I worked with uh, off and on when I was in Washington D.C. Uh, doing research. So, and as a journalist. We have these people, many of them are in Congress, many of them are in journalism, but they cannot seem to gain a foothold in the public imagination. And I think that's that's a great problem. I'm not sure that answered your question. Feel free to ask it again. I, I have been accused of wandering. Uh, and I do that even when I'm speaking to scholars who are, you know, supposed to be learning from me. And you're learning from me and I do it to you too. Oh, you want to talk a little bit about um, getting somebody's talking about the Southern Poverty Law Center? I still have friends who work at the Southern Poverty Law Center, and I uh, am especially good friends with one of their key researchers who prefers to remain anonymous and um, does not live in the South. Uh, there are people at all all of the major groups, whether it's the Anti-Defamation League, the American Jewish Committee, the American Jewish Congress, the Southern Poverty Law Center, my old alumni at Political Research Associates, the Western States Center, the Highlander Center, all of these groups do good research about racism, sexism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia. And you know, all of these groups, I, I donate to all of them just so I can say I donate to all these groups. Um, and I do. And in one way or the other, uh, I either send money or I assist people uh, off the record doing background support work in, in these organizations. Now, in some cases, some of the leaders of these organizations would be appalled and upset that this goes on. But, you know, good researchers like to talk to each other, even if their bosses think the people they're talking to are putzes. <laughs> so what do you think the future of these groups are going to be as Biden's term goes on? They'll retreat for a while and then they'll come back. Uh, these groups go back to even before the Ku Klux Klan, back to the founding, to the storming of the armory in Massachusetts uh, by a group of people who opposed the whiskey tax. This goes all the way back. Uh, it will come back again. It will continue to come back again. This is why we need groups like the ADL, the American Jewish Committee, uh, and the American Gru uh, Jewish Congress, and this new center at, um, you know, uh, well, there's a couple new centers. One, one's at Berkeley, and and one's up at um, I'm going to forget now the up oh, the Hudson River, at uh, it's terrible getting old. <laughs> so so the, so they'll they'll retreat for a while. Um... While Biden is in office, and then um... no, they'll retreat for a while in terms of months. Oh, in terms of months. Oh, I'm afraid so. And then the, on the slide, they will start to rebuild. And so the question: all social movements start sort of down here in the in the weeds, right? And then they sort of get more of a voice, and then they get major media attention up here with the talking heads. Um, and so what we have now is um, a major so set of social movements with some coordination uh, and with an internet and a web uh, that allows for that uh, to have been pushed back, uh, but they're already regrouping. And, and as I say, you know, they have their own uh, media where you can go now and see how they're, uh, they're doing criticism, self-criticism. They're saying, what is it we did wrong? And people say, well, we did this wrong. And, and other people say, well, I don't think that, that was so wrong. But and so they're actually reevaluating what they did and, and what went wrong. Um, that's what all good social movements do. I wish they weren't a good social movement. They're a set of social movements. They interact. It's just like uh, all sorts of other social movements, whether religious, political, or, or whatever, or social. Um, they'll be back. Uh, they have been here since the Know Nothings. So they have been here since the Klan. They have been here since the McCarthy period. Uh, they have been here since Trump. They will come back. So is, is there a group that that's a particular should be a particular concern for us at the temple? 
Yeah, you mean in the Burlington area? Yeah. As luck as uh, <laughs> in as luck would have it, there's a lot of really good uh, groups from a variety of bases that monitor this and fight against it and and put on programs against bigotry. Um, Obviously, you, you know some of the main ones, the uh, Anti-Defamation League, the American Jewish Committee, the American Jewish Congress, Political Research Associates, and on and on and on. Um, there's, you know, if you're retired and want to be horrified, there's a huge library you can go to at Political Research Associates and read shelves full of anti-Semitic, racist, homophobic, Islamophobic, uh, by appointment uh, material. Actually, you can't now because of the pandemic, but after the pandemic. And uh, at Tufts University, all of our, all of the files are being archived and will be open to the public for serious researchers from uh, both my files and the files of others and the files uh, of political research associates and the public eye network uh, are all being archived at Tufts University and after the pandemic will be openly available for researchers who have to leave everything but you know their clothing and their pencil and some paper uh, at the door when they enter the archive. So uh, unlike uh, the LaRouche people stealing from New York University, you, then you won't go into the library at NYU and find hundreds of pages missing. So, so what, what's, what, can you leave us on a note of hope or optimism? <laughs> well, I, you know, I try. I, I often, you know, forget to do that. I think things are getting better. I think we see much more awareness in terms of the mainstream media now, especially after their failures in Trump, which was a step backwards. But I think most mainstream media now have people on them who are more educated. And this is true for, I think if you go back, I, I'm over 70, I can go back at 30 years and look at the awareness of the mainstream media of these issues. And, and it is so much better now than it was back then. And it always can be better and it needs to be better. Uh, but you have to remember that there were people in the American Jewish Committee, American Jewish Congress, ADL, uh, left groups, Jewish groups who warned against uh, warned the U.S. government that there would be a major uh, bombing attack on a U.S. federal facility prior to the Oklahoma City bombing, and we were dismissed as cranks. So, so are you saying that 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 we've got more knowledge now, and and we we have. <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is that we have much more knowledge now than we did then. We had enough knowledge then to warn people. But I think if you look at the way all governments are run, these warnings are to this day still ignored and still dismissed too much by the people who actually do the work for our U.S. government. I mean, right now, if you go to the Department of uh, uh, Homeland Security website, you'll see thousands of words on how Jews control the media, which I cannot get taken down. So if you want to contact the Department of Homeland Security and ask why their academic website refuses to take down anti-Semitic documentation of the protocols. Someone has essentially reframed the protocols and posted them in their own language on the Department of uh, Homeland Security website. And as of yesterday, they were still up there. Well, that, that's horrifying. Isn't it, though? And, <laughs> and, and I can send, um, I mean, it's, uh, there's, a, there's an article out about it now. I can um, send it uh, to the rabbi and she can distribute it, uh, I hope, some way. Uh, I, 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 I don't want to share it online. Is there anything else that we can do right now to kind of? I think I can talk to your neighbors. It's the best possible thing. It is what sociology taught me. I, I'm not a sociologist, but I play on a TV. I read sociology voraciously. And what you learn is when you talk to your neighbors, 
uh, about something that's on your mind that troubles you, no matter what it is, whether it's racism, sexism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, the problem with the park district, that accomplishes something incredibly valuable. To sit at home and stew about it and only talk it to people you know really well in a different social setting, like in a religious setting or a school setting, you need to talk to your neighbors because that's the kind of uh, communication that actually sends ripples through a community much more effectively. Like, like, like a reality check. Like, like when you hear somebody outside of somebody's own media bubble um, saying, you know, a real person talking about these things from a different perspective, like they're, they're kind of forced to think about it in a different way. Absolutely true. The best way to convince something is, is to talk to a neighbor or a friend or don't, don't talk to relatives. It's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it never ends well at Christmas or Hanukkah. Just Apparently you've relatives. met my relatives. I guess. I've met everyone's relatives. <laughs> it's, just, it's universal, trust me. So, uh, but neighbors, people who wor you work with, people in your religious or frat fraternal order or, or sororal, whatever, that helps. Yeah, I think what makes that hard sometimes, Chip, is we've all kind of been trained to avoid certain uh, topics that are sensitive, right? You know, you don't bring up politics you know, at work or with neighbors. And, you know, is there a is there a nice opening question that you think is safer to ask? Thanks for asking. You ask your neighbor, let's say it eight months ago, you go to a neighbor over the fence and say, you know, you don't usually talk about this, but I think some of the things Trump is saying and, and doing scares me. Stop. What do you think? This is a trick used by sociologists around the world. <laughs> it is amazing what happens when you express a concern and then ask a question of someone and then stop talking and just stop talking and smile at them and nod. Because after a while, there's this in every culture, in, in bread need to say something. And the longer you remain quiet, nodding and smiling, the more this wells up in them like a sinister force grabbing their brain saying, say something, say something. And it works, I'd say, 95% of the time. Well, that, that's, that's awesome because I know I've, <laughs> I've, I've failed miserably with my one friend from that persuasion. Um, <laughs> I have not been able to find a way to... <laughs> To, you know, we, we just kind of yell at each other all the time. Uh, I get it. I, and, and, you know, there's a reason you're angry. But, you know, what's better uh, to be angry and unhappy or to open a conversation that might teach you something in terms of how to talk to a neighbor who you can't obviously do something to their house, like, you know, run rats into it. Uh, not suggesting that. Um, you must learn how to talk to your neighbor like you think democracy depends on it because learning how to talk to every neighbor is what democracy depends on. All politics is local. All politics is local. Thank you. Well, I think that's a great note to end on, Chip. That, that was, this was fantastic, and, and I, I thank you so much. I think you've taught all of us so much, um, and I really, really, really appreciate your Thank you. <laughs>